It started as one of the most perfect art heists. Two Rubid sketches stolen in broad daylight from a gallery in Spain, leaving no clues. With the art world on high alert, trying to sell the stolen paintings was to prove the thief's biggest challenge. Once the paintings came on the market, the police, lawyers, and art experts came up with an elaborate plan to get each painting back. This is the story of how two Rubin sketches were stolen and recovered. But who was the mastermind behind the theft? La Coruña is a small fishing town on the Atlantic coast of northern Spain. From these harbor walls in the 16th century, the mighty Spanish Armada set sail to conquer England. It ended in disaster. The town attracted Spanish high society, who were patrons to the local gallery. The Museum of Fine Art is home to many priceless works of art, among them Goya's, Velázquez, and Van Dyck's. The most valuable pieces in the collection are two small sketches by the Flemish master, Rubens. Painted in 1636, they hang side by side. La Coruña is a peaceful place. September 16, 1985 is a quiet day. A man wearing a dark coat enters the Museum of Fine Art. The museum has no high-tech security system and only two security guards to watch over the entire gallery. The man in the black coat admires Rubens' work. When the security guards are not looking, he gets to work stealing the sketches. Using an ordinary screwdriver, he quickly pries the paintings out of their frames and hides them in his coat pocket. muy simple. The paintings had a very simple frame, so it was easy to take them out. There was some damage, not because it was difficult, but because they were old and fragile, because they were from the 17th century. The thief is able to walk out of the museum before anybody notices the paintings are missing. It could not have been simpler. The robbery was very easy because of the simplicity of the location. It had no system or ways of stopping them being stolen. No clues were left at the scene and the police had no leads. The two Rubin sketches just disappeared. Peter Paul Rubens was one of the greatest artists of the 17th century and the master of the Baroque style. Because of his fame, the demand for Rubens' work was huge. To keep up with this demand, Rubens ran a studio employing every able painter in Antwerp. Rubens, for each picture, would paint an autograph, an authentic oil sketch. Sketch is perhaps uh, a misleading word because it was really a model, close to what an architect does with his blueprints. It was small, but it gave all the lines, the colors, the information that his assistants would need to render the full-size picture. So it was a work of art in its own right, and even in Rubens' day, uh, was collected, was kept as a valuable picture on the wall.
Even today, the stolen sketches have an estimated value of one and a half million dollars each. Both of the stolen paintings depicted characters from Greek mythology and were preliminary sketches for a larger series of paintings commissioned by the Spanish king, Philip IV. They were small oak panel paintings called bozzettos, measuring only 10 inches by six. Daedalus and the Minotaur is based on Ovid's account of the building of the labyrinth. Daedalus, the architect hired by King Minos, is showing the Minotaur the labyrinth he has constructed. The other painting, the Aurora, features the Roman goddess of dawn sitting on a cloud. She holds a crystal vase in her right hand to collect the morning dew. Both paintings show Rubens at the height of his expressive powers in the final stages of his life. These two paintings are very important because you can see all of Rubens' skills and all of his artistic ability. You can see the way he is a master of the Baroque style and technique and his handling of light. The paintings are very small, but very important. Nothing was heard about the paintings for four months until 1,600 miles away in Sweden's capital, Stockholm, a breakthrough came. At the National Gallery, Director of Research, Gorel Cavalli Björkman, was holding her weekly open house where members of the public can bring works of art along to be authenticated. One of them arrived with what at first sight seemed to be a fake Rubens painting. Harald Lüth came to see me with the painting because he knew that I was the expert on Dutch and Flemish paintings. And we unpacked it on the table and uh, looked at it for some time together. I saw it was really interesting. And he wanted to know if he owned Rubens. I thought it must be a copy. It usually is. I knew Rubens Bozzettos, how loosely they were painted and, and very fresh, like a drawing in a way. And I said, could I keep it? When I have time, I want to go through this painting. Gorel was busy and needed more time to study the painting in detail. She had no inkling of its suspect provenance. Time passed, days passed, and there wasn't really time. And then he suddenly phoned and said, the friend wants the painting back. He only was the messenger for a friend. Harold Leith wanted to come and collect the painting that very afternoon. Gorel had minutes to research the sketch. She turned to the definitive work on Rubens by Professor Julius Held. I hurried to the library and got Julius Held's book on Rubens' oil sketches. And I flipped through the book and I saw this particular painting. So my first reaction was, is this a copy or is it the original? I looked very thoroughly, and you can recognize a copy. There is always some details that are different. It's best with very good black and white photographs where you can see the details very clearly, because then you can compare the lines and the brush strokes and everything.
I could see that every line was the same. Well, I thought it looks like the original, you know. It doesn't look like a copy. And um, so I looked at the back of the book where the catalogue was and saw that the painting belonged to a small museum in, in Spain, which I didn't know. This museum and this city even, I didn't know. So I phoned the Prado. Que fue, para mí fue una, no, cierta sorpresa, cierta satisfacción. The chief of conservation at the Stockholm Museum, Gorell, phoned me and asked me, as a specialist in Flemish paintings, if the paintings they had were related to any Spanish paintings. Gorell's worst fears were confirmed. The painting, Daedalus and the Minotaur, had been stolen from a gallery in La Coruña. Time was running out for Gorel to find a way to keep hold of the painting before Harold Leith arrived. I was, you know, agitated, <laughs> shocked in a way, because what should I do? He was coming very soon, so I phoned our lawyer at the museum and he said, well, you have to, according to Swedish law, you can't keep the painting. Gorell knew that by giving it back to Harold Leith, the masterpiece might never be seen again. So I had to tell him, but he didn't want to be involved, he said. It's really not my friend. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's not a friend, it's just an acquaintance of my wife's. I just offered to do this, and uh, I don't know this person very well. So we phoned the police. With the whereabouts of the Rubens sketch unknown, Klaus Trogzig of Stockholm's police led the investigation. He needed to know more about Harold Leith, the man who had brought the painting to the National Gallery. Get it. Telegraph from, from Interpol in Stockholm. That was the start of the investigation. I only have this name, Harald Lüth, and he was not in our files. I called him about the painting. Lüth, a local artist in Stockholm, was brought in for questioning. He told police he was simply helping a friend authenticate a painting. I don't think he realized that was the real one. He told me that the friend of his have given the painting to him. Leith was able to give police a vital lead, the phone number of his friend, Moll Merna. I talked to Bo Merner, and that was the same day and I get to name Ramon. All the police knew about Ramon was that he was Moll Merna's brother-in-law. I called Ramon, told him I want to speak to him and he come to the police station. We have a good speak and he told me something about this painting and he don't have the painting in his hand. Ramon claimed he owned the painting, but he insisted that it was not an original Rubens. He act like a businessman. He was not nervous. Poker face. Ramon told police he had taken the painting to a local gallery and had asked them to sell it. They sent the painting first to Sotheby's in London who then passed it on to their New York office for authentication and auction. Stockholm police were worried that with the painting out of Swedish jurisdiction, they had to act fast to stop it slipping from their hands forever. They contacted Sotheby's and were able to persuade them to return the painting to Sweden.
Klaus now had the stolen painting safely in custody. He decided to bring Ramon in for questioning. He discovered that he had two low-paying jobs as a chauffeur and a cleaner. So I want to know how he got the painting and why. Ramon came up with a bizarre explanation. He claimed he was working with two South American students who had the painting and wanted $30,000 for it. He told me that this South American was studying Leningrad to finance the guerrilla movement in South America. I don't believe him, but we have to check it up. The police investigated the cleaning company, where Ramon said the students worked. We can't find anything that say that he has right or wrong. Klaus asked Ramon where he got the money to buy the painting. Once again, Ramon had the answers ready. He had a loan from his brother who had contact with the bank in Spain. But when Klaus contacted the bank, they had never heard of Ramon. There was something wrong about what he told me. Klaus had enough evidence to apply for a search warrant from the state prosecutor. It was my decision to look, uh, to look around in his apartment. Police raided Ramon's apartment in Stockholm, looking for evidence. They were also searching for the second Rubens painting stolen from La Coruña, the Aurora. The Aurora sketch was not found in his home. But the police did have one lucky break. They found Ramon's passport and it provided a vital clue. We find his Swedish passport and we check up the stamps and find that he was in Spain at the time of the theft. The passport proved that Ramon was in La Coruña at the time of the theft, but the police still had no evidence to prove he stole the paintings. Klaus Trotzig and, and me, we instinctively knew this is the thief in La Coruña. <laughs> I was scratching him seven times. The police discovered details of Ramon's background and his childhood in Spain. As a child, he was living in uh, La Coruña. Painting was stolen from a museum in Spain, about five minutes' walk from his home. We could find on a map that his school and the museum was on one line from his uh, home. <laughs> probably pass the way to when he go to school. He has passed that museum uh, many, many times uh, as a child. The evidence was circumstantial. Hans couldn't prove he stole the painting, but he could charge Ramon with handling stolen goods. Not the thief, but handling stolen goods. It's the uh, second best. Hans took the case to the district court in Stockholm on January 12, 1987, where Ramon was charged with being in possession of a stolen Rubens painting. But Ramon pleaded not guilty, claiming the painting was not the original but a copy. 
He made a very nice impression. I could have met him normally as a friend uh, in a party or something, uh, drinking wine and uh, talking about picture, because he was so nice and so decent and civilized. In court, Hans confronted Ramon about the inconsistencies in his story, the passport stamps, the elusive students who said he sold him the painting, and the question of how he could afford to buy the painting, working as a cleaner and chauffeur. I couldn't, in court, uh, get him upset. He behaved himself, uh, he was never, never upset. Never, never. Whatever he says, it's not right, it's a lie. But however cool Ramon remained, the court did not believe his story, and he was convicted of handling the stolen painting. As a prosecutor, you don't look too much uh, in their faces, but I notice in the eye he is just cold. And, and, uh... But if Hans thought that was the end of the story, he was wrong. Ramon appealed his conviction at the district court, and his lawyer came up with an ingenious defense. Ramon may only have been a chauffeur and cleaner, but he was able to hire the best and most expensive lawyer in Sweden. He claimed the painting could not possibly be the same Rubens that was stolen in Spain. It was five millimeters smaller. He made a very, very good job trying to prove that it wasn't the original Rubens. They talk about small difference. Five millimeters smaller. He's the best lawyer. So we lost the case. Ramon had managed to convince the appeals court that his Rubens was a fake. The police and prosecution were horrified. We were afraid that we should come to a point when we have to give it back to him. We all felt that this is not right. Afterwards, when I heard that, I said, it's foolish because panel Paintings change size when they are in a dry and in a moist environment. Wood shrinks mm -hmm. and expands uh, according to the air humidity. If you have an old cupboard, you can hear how it cracks sometimes when it's very dry. And, or somebody made a mistake when they proofread the catalogue. Or somebody could measure wrongly, of course. But half a centimeter, I noticed that in mm -hmm. old inventories. And I, if I measure it again, we make it more thoroughly, perhaps, now. Hans was convinced that Ramon was guilty and decided to take the case to the highest court in the land the Swedish Supreme Court. I was desperate because I was so convinced that it was the original, just because of a shrinking oak. But how to prove it? Then Gorel came up with a dramatic way of proving the painting was the genuine stolen Rubens. I could take a transparency photo of the painting and another photo from the book. Then they called me as a witness. So I was asked to come up to the judges. I could slide this transparency over the other photo. Every line went into the right place. Uh, 
and so it was closed. It was perfectly fixed. She could show that it was the original. Finally, the prosecution had got their man. Ramon was convicted and sentenced to two years in prison. I felt good. I felt justice as one. Well. I was just a bit angry that I couldn't prove that he was uh, the thief in, in La Coruña. But bizarrely, under Swedish law, if you have no previous convictions, you are allowed six months to put your affairs in order before beginning your sentence. Ramon didn't waste the opportunity. He simply got on a plane and disappeared. We heard he was going to Spain and to Japan and then to South America. And we haven't heard anything about him since then. Daedalus and the Minotaur was returned to the gallery in La Coruña. But where on earth was the other Rubens masterpiece, the Aurora? And where was the mysterious Ramon? It would be another six years before anyone got a clue to the whereabouts of the second missing Rubens. It came on the other side of the Atlantic, in Miami, Florida, and from an unexpected source. U.S. Customs, normally used to catching drug dealers, received some undercover information. I received a call from a source of information. He knew this uh, female in Miami who had a stolen and smuggled uh, Rubens painting, keyword was smuggled, and we worked smuggling cases, so we knew that we had something that was potentially worthy of investigation. When David met his source, he learned that the seller was a woman called Orly Bagel. He said it was a Rubens sketch painted on a, a thin wood panel. It really meant nothing to me at all. I wasn't familiar with Rubens. I wasn't familiar with, with his works at all. Um, this was the first and only case of this type that I've worked. It was brand new to me. David put a team together to help with the investigation. He needed someone to go undercover. I asked an agent in our group, Hank, if he would meet with the individuals, you know, in an undercover capacity and uh, represent a buyer. He was the oldest agent in the group and he had a pretty extensive undercover experience in narcotics cases and other customs type cases. And he looked the least likely to be suspected of, of being a law enforcement officer. We had the source contact Orly by phone and he told her he had someone who might be interested and would like to see the painting, so he asked Orly if she could produce it. Hank needed to meet with Orly and see exactly what she had for sale. The meeting took place in the lobby of a hotel in Miami Beach. Orly suggested that location. She felt comfortable there. At the meeting, Two Latin males arrived with a briefcase. And that was the first time we knew of anybody else besides Orly being involved. The painting was produced from the briefcase. They had painting that they wanted to sell. Hank was playing the role of, as the buyer's representative. He didn't do a lot of talking at the meeting. The source did most of the talking. Hank just looked at the painting, um, made a couple of mental notes. He didn't know what he was looking for. The meeting had been a success for both sides. Orly thought she had found a buyer, 
while Hank had seen the painting he thought was called The Dawn. Hank came back and he had an interesting way of communicating. Just the way he said it was pretty funny at the time. Told us it's a painting on a thin piece of wood and it's a, a fat lady sitting on a cloud holding a lamp in her hand. It was in a subsequent telephone call where they started to talk about the price. Uh, Orly stated they wanted three and a half million dollars for the painting. She wanted to be paid in cash. He said that was fine. Of course, he knew we were never going to pay her anything anyway. At this stage, all David knew about the sketch was it was painted by Rubens and was very expensive. Initially, we, we started doing research to see if we could, um, you know, identify any Rubens works. An agent in our office, Zach Mann, went to the University of Miami Library. We wanted to look at any artwork that we could compare to the description. All Zach had to go on was Hank's description and the name, The Dawn. So I was looking through the books. Zach located a picture of the painting in, in one of those books. The picture was a perfect match for what Hank had seen at the meeting. The problem was it had the wrong name. It was called The Aurora. When Zach showed Hank the book, he immediately recognized it. They then decided to contact the author, Professor Julius Held. We had a, a photograph from one of Dr. Held's books. I had spoken to Professor Julius Held. Dr. Held was the world's leading expert on Rubens, but was too old to travel to Miami. He suggested contacting his protege, Charles Scribner, in New York. I had spoken to Dr. Charles Scribner, um, another Rubens expert. I got a telephone call at my office. A voice on the other end of the line said, this is Special Agent David D'Amato from U.S. Customs. My immediate response was, oh my God, what have I smuggled? What am I in trouble for? And then he went on to explain that he'd been given my name by Professor Julius Held, who was the world's leading Rubens and Rembrandt expert. Dr. Scribner lived in New York and had worked for Professor Held. He knew precisely the sketch that U.S. Customs were interested in. Hank's description of the Aurora as a fat lady sitting on a cloud holding a, a glass is a fair description, if somewhat cruel. I mean, she's only fat by comparison to Audrey Hepburn and current day actresses. In Rubens' day, she would have been considered an ideal woman. You dare not call a woman today Rubensian or you'll have your face slapped. But she's, she's a beautiful woman sitting on a cloud because dawn comes with clouds. The crystal vase that she holds in her hand holds dew, which is what dawn brings. And in paintings of, of dawn at work, so to speak, you see her scattering the dew. It became clear that dawn and aurora were the same painting. I realized, you know, we had something uh, potentially uh, of, of value. But was it genuine or a fake? If the painting turned out to be a fake, it would be worthless and the police couldn't arrest Orly Bagel. And they wanted an, a Rubens expert to come down. We knew we had to get the painting authenticated. You want to make sure that it is, in fact, the art that is stolen, that it's legitimate, that it's real. I mean, you don't want to necessarily pursue someone who's you know, painting sketches in his garages and calling him Van Gogh or something like that. They wanted me to come down on Saturday. I knew that I had two very young children, and I knew my wife would be furious if I took off and said, I'm going to Miami Beach on Saturday and left her with the children. So I, t I explained to them that I could not come down Saturday. Could they wait till Monday? And they were very uneasy about that because it meant keeping the criminals on the tenderhook uh, over the weekend, and they might suspect something. Already, Customs feared that Orly Bagel might be backing out of the deal. 
where she really started to get cold feet was uh, in, in subsequent telephone conversations. She had contacted the source between meetings and she said it, it, it seemed like it was going a little too easy. Um, she even asked the source if, uh, if how well he knew Hank and how well, you know, whether or not he knew uh, Hank was a law enforcement officer. And the source assured her that he was not and, you know, that um, she could proceed. Everything was fine. With Orly beginning to have second thoughts about the deal, Hank moved quickly to set up a second meeting. We had told Orly that we would have an expert on that day, but it was a bluff. I had spoken to Professor Julius Held and I had spoken to Dr. Charles Scribner. So we had the experts giving us characteristics to look for. We were told to look for a crack about a centimeter in from the left side running straight down from top to bottom. Uh, also the stylus pinpricks we were told ran along that crack. The catalog reference number was in the lower right hand corner and it was painted out in a white paint. We were told to look for certain blemishes, like these blemishes down here, this dark spot here, this scratch right here. And we could also see all these things in the photograph that we had by that time of the uh, original painting. Hank went into the second meeting. He was wearing a wire. Um, he also had a camera hidden in a briefcase. We have agents around, so we were monitoring the whole thing from, from outside. This time, Hank was looking for specific marks Charles told him would only be on the original. Hank noted a crack down the left side stylus pinpricks and certain blemishes. The only thing missing was the catalog reference number. So he asked one of the Latin males who had brought the painting if there was any way he could contact the, the owner uh, to ascertain what had happened to that number or anything about the number. And so the younger Latin male stepped away and made a phone call uh, and came back in the room, said he had spoken to the owner and that the owner told him he had removed that reference number because he didn't want the painting traced. The younger Latino male told Orly the number which had been removed from the corner of the painting was 284. It should have been 285. However, 284 was the catalog number for Daedalus and the Minotaur. So it seemed they had a real Rubens and it linked the two paintings together. We had a, a, a real Rubens, and it was this painting taken in 1985 along with a second Rubens painting. After the meeting, I, I recontacted Dr. Scribner, and, um, and then he agreed to fly down on Monday morning. I was terribly excited. I thought it sounded like the greatest adventure of my life, an armed sting operation with federal undercover agents. I love the idea of it. I think Dave kind of talked him into coming down and telling him that he would have the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, this was going to be real Miami Vice for Charles Scribner. I was two weeks away from my 40th birthday, and I thought, what a, what a glorious way to go out before hitting 40 at age 39 in an undercover operation with federal agents in Miami Beach over Rubens, which was my specialty. Charles Scribner took the first flight from New York to Miami. Agent Mann picked him up at the airport and brought him to the briefing. He seemed quite excited, excited and nervous. They were so organized and they had this conference room set up and they had Professor Hell's book that I had worked on. This is amazing. They had all their notes and they were assigning jobs and I thought this is, this is amazing. It's like being, you know, back at university. We have briefings, uh, they're very detailed. There's a lot of issues that need to be discussed such as, you know, surveillance teams, security, everything down to, um, you know, where's the closest hospital in case something were to go wrong. Initially, I thought of this as an acting assignment. 
When I was a schoolboy, I originally wanted to be an actor. Whenever we do any kind of a, a arrest, a takedown operation like that, uh, agents are armed. We wear bulletproof vests. He was talking about everybody would be wearing a bulletproof vest. And I then innocently asked, well, do I get a vest too? Thinking, what a stupid question, of course I got a vest. And they looked at me and they said, oh, no, no, you can't wear a vest. We told him, no, it would, it would be a little bulky, it wouldn't look right, and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, we couldn't do that. It was at that point I realized, whoa, this isn't just an acting assignment, this is serious, this is for real. That may have been a, a reality moment for him, saying that, uh, you know, it's not television, it's not Miami Vice on TV, this is... Uh, you know, real law enforcement. And then somebody in the meeting had mentioned earlier operation where something had gone askew and somebody had been shot. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> this is not only serious, it's dangerous. And uh, so that got my adrenaline pumping, but that's probably a good thing. I asked him to, um, to go into the meeting and to look at the painting and basically just to tell Hank, the undercover agent, whether or not it was, it was authentic. Dave asked him to really not say a whole lot, just kind of confirm that it was in fact a, a true Rubens. Just to nod or give a signal to Hank that it was real or even to go on the side and, and, and talk to him for a minute, but not to get involved in any, any kind of negotiations or any conversation with the subjects. Well, I thought this is a rather, you know, this is like a walk on a spear carrier in Aida. I didn't fly all the way down to Miami Beach to look at a painting and just nod my head or shake my head, I thought, I may have to ad lib. The sting operation swung into action. Armed police took up their places around the hotel, while Charles Scribner, Hank, and the source made their way to the lobby. The lobby was a scene out of some movie. It was very Art Deco. It was a kind of low-budget Art Deco. So we sat down at a nice table with a picture window uh, overlooking the beach and there was a swimming pool in the background and one solitary Sunday there a young woman taking in the mid-morning rays of the sun and it, it, it was all a scene out of a movie. It had everything in it but Richard Gere. And I remember there was a jukebox playing and I said to Orley, this hotel could be right out of a Scott Fitzgerald novel if it weren't for the jukebox. And my part was to be part of the surveillance team outside with other agents watching and listening everything that was going on at the time. Hank noticed that a fourth individual was present who was a surprise to him. He had not seen him at, at the previous meetings. And Orly told Hank that this fourth individual was uh, going to provide security for her and to accompany Hank to the bank. When you hear security, you usually think of, um, of weapons and, and so we thought it was possible he, he might be armed. Then came the moment Charles Scribner had been waiting for. Agent Hank really took charge and Orley delivered uh, to Agent Hank a manila envelope. And that was it. And so he gave it to me and I was, uh, I was astonished. I said, this is the picture? I mean, it was, it was in the kind of envelope that you'd get some legal documents. There was no padding, there was no careful wrapping. It was just in a, a regular legal envelope. And I, I pulled it out and it was wrapped in this sort of red, slightly greasy cloth. And I removed the cloth and there in its full glory was Aurora. On this lovely little panel, a piece of wood, uh, with in, in oils, and it was as the second I saw it, I knew it was an original Rubens. But I was so outraged and surprised that they would have been so casual 
about the handling of this picture that I immediately re remonstrated with them and, and scolded them and said, this is no way to wrap a Rubens. I said, next time, be sure you have it wrapped up in bubble paper and preferably leave a frame on it. I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this was not part of the plan. They all were kind of nodding and smiling sheepishly. And there's always the chance that something can be said that doesn't make sense to the people who have the painting. I hadn't taught a class on Rubens since 1976. It had been 15 years earlier. And from now I was back in the classroom and I think my students couldn't leave. So I thought I'm gonna make the most of this. So I started discussing the picture and how it was painted and what the subject was and was it Dawn, was it Aurora, or was it Psyche, the goddess of the soul, the personification of the soul. There's always the possibility of uh, armed security in any type of deal. I mean, you're talking millions of dollars and uh, you're dealing with bad guys who think they're dealing with bad guys and uh, so that's always a concern. I think it was about this time that I felt even more relaxed now in the back in the classroom so to speak and I thought I'd have a little fun with the crooks and so Orly was clearly their spokesman. So I looked at her and I said tell me this is the most beautiful Rubens oil sketch I have ever seen outside of a museum knowing full well it had come from a museum. Where did you get it? There was this pause, silence. Agent Hank, I thought, was at this point, was about to have a coronary. And she didn't miss a beat. She looked at me and smiled and she said, inheritance. And I thought that is the classiest, most clever answer. I could not have dreamed it up in her position. I thought this is one smooth woman. I'm sitting there just thinking, gosh, you know, <laughs> it's not what we uh, planned and um, hopefully he'll uh, you know, cut his lecture short here. Agent Hank had asked me whether I thought it was original. I said, yes. Are you absolutely sure? And I said, yes, absolutely sure. And he said, on a, a scale of one to 10, what would you say? And I said, on a scale of one to 10, I would say it's an 11. And then he asked again, and I thought, this is getting a little redundant. He said, well, just how positive are you? And I thought, I've got to close this line of questioning. I said that I had two sons back home in New York, and I often wondered where they came from. But I had no doubt where this picture came from. And everybody kind of chuckled, and that was the end of that line of questioning. I was uh, with other agents outside the, the hotel um, waiting for a signal to go in to make arrests. Um, that signal would be Dr. Scribner leaving the hotel, walking out to the street. I was just kind of crossing my fingers hoping uh, everything uh, went as we thought it would. Agent Hank said the next stop was they were going to go to the bank and he was going to get the money and pay for the picture and my role was over. One of the group of four was clearly the bodyguard, and I assumed was the gunman. He exchanged some expression with the informer. This fourth individual seemed to be pretty street smart, and he decided it was time to leave. He had a feeling something was going to be coming down. Charles Scribner got up and left. He came up to me and he said, I'm going with them. At that point, I thought, oh my God, they must sense that something is suspicious and they're sending him to hold me hostage. By the time we got to the hotel lobby entrance, he had vanished. When Charles walked out of the hotel, I said, Dave, you know, he's cleared the hotel. You know, it's a go. They're out. And I gave the signal to move in. And the next moment, you know, uh, armed agents went into the hotel. In my mind, everything was, was fine. You have agents coming in from all directions, the different uh, access points to the lobby. And you secure the lobby and you arrest the individuals. Hank informed us immediately that a fourth individual had been present. He described him physically to us. So myself and another agent began to look for him. We started a search of the area. Hank didn't see where he went, 
but he knew that he, he was somewhere still in the building. We actually found him in a laundry room. There's a bathroom off to the corner and I, the door was wide open. And as we went into the room, I just noticed a slight movement between the door and the door jam. And that indicated to me that someone was behind that door and we identified ourselves in no uncertain terms and uh, pulled him out and placed him under arrest. The sting had worked. The entire gang had been arrested and the stolen Rubens recovered. I felt good about it. We, uh, we had accomplished what we wanted and, uh, and the main thing was nobody got hurt. We had four subjects in custody and uh, everybody did their part and it was, uh, it was a good feeling. The suspects were arrested, the painting was recovered, nobody was injured. I mean, it was really picture perfect. You know, it was just the way uh, a takedown should take place. I was now out on the street. There was a lot of commotion. All the, the armed U.S. custom agents had come in with their guns pulled and they, and they had arrested the people inside. You know, he thought it was quite exciting, you know, that to have participated in an undercover meeting that was very successful. And the best part of it was the end. When I got to my plane and they were closing the door and I had a government issued ticket and I said, the government wants me back in New York immediately. And she looked at the ticket and she said, okay, you can get on the plane. So I got on an earlier flight. And I thought that was the perfect ending to this adventure. Immediately after the arrests, uh, myself and Hank brought Orly into an office. Well, Orly fell apart when we went in. She, um, she was reduced to tears immediately, uh, very shaken up by the whole experience, um, very scared. I took her handcuffs off her, uh, wanted to make her feel a little more relaxed. And she told us the whole story from start to finish. Orly Bagel said the painting had been brought up from Nicaragua. She was merely brokering a deal for the Alvarez brothers, who were acting for the mysterious owner of the painting. We asked Orly how they came up with the price of three and a half million, and she said that the owner had wanted one million dollars for the painting and that anything they could make over that would be split four ways between the four people involved here in Miami. So they, they got greedy and they, they asked three and a half million. But what was the identity of the owner? The name turned out to be familiar. After the arrest, when we went back to the office, the younger Alvarez agreed to, to talk with us. And he told us that he had brought the painting up in, a, in, in the briefcase, the same briefcase we saw at the meeting. And he said he was uh, doing it for this individual in Nicaragua, Ramon. The police set up a trap to implicate Ramon. When I heard the name Ramon mentioned, I assumed it was the same Ramon. We asked him to ask Ramon uh, what the lowest amount of money he would accept for the painting uh, would be. And Ramon replied, one million. As far as I know, Ramon is still a, uh, an Interpol fugitive, uh, international fugitive from the, the, um, the case in Sweden. Both paintings were reunited side by side to great public relief in Spain. But questions were asked about security to ensure this could never happen again. The public reaction was remarkable. 
People were now aware of how important the paintings were. And all this contributed to the building of the new museum. On December 12, 1995, the paintings moved to a brand new home in La Coruña with the latest security systems. They now have a place of pride in the gallery. But Ramon, the man who stole the paintings, is still at liberty. Mm -hmm.